Hello everyone. This episode focuses on cervical cancer and cervical cancer awareness month. It is dubbed cervical cancer decoding the big C with Amref Health Africa's new strategy. Joining us will be our special guests, Dr. Chris Baraza, who is an obstetrician gynecologist and chief of party at Amref Health Africa in Kenya and Dr. Benjamin Odongo Eli, gynecological oncologist and acting CEO of Kenya's Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Kenya, COGS. So uh, before we get into the podcast, please tell us about yourself, Dr. Baraza. So do you have any surprising talents or hobbies that most people don't know about? I'll ask my senior to start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, medicine is like military. <laughs> so yeah. do you have any hobbies or hidden talents that you can share with us today just so that we can break the ice? Yeah, thank you for having me here. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe one of the talents, I would really, really call it a talent, is the ability to adapt mm-hmm. To situations like uh, when Dr. Baraza asked me to come to this podcast, <laughs> I really didn't know what to expect. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, so I am here <laughs> to see whether we can share the knowledge mm-hmm. and uh, also the both the clinical and the public health aspects, so that so we can be able to address this uh, the disease that's affecting our women. Okay. And what about you, Dr. Chris? Any hobbies? I or play interests? badminton. Oh, cool! Yeah. Really? Yeah. I'm yeah? not so sure you knew that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And lawn tennis. Oh. Those are my hobbies. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. great. And I do cycling actually every day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's good. You're very healthy. I just did it today in the morning. I usually do my 15 kilometers every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question I have for you guys is: Who has been your major inspiration, professionally or personally, in your lives? Um, maybe I go first again. I I, I wouldn't really say one particular person, but it's uh, quite a number of uh, individuals that I've uh, read about um, and I've admired their achievements. Uh, I'll give an example of Malcolm X, mm-hmm. uh, having come from a, a background that was not really promising, and he rose to the point of being a major player in the struggle for the civil rights of the black people. I keep remembering one of his speeches called the ballot or the or the bullet, mm-hmm. another one called by any means necessary, which really inspired the movement towards uh, desegregation. And you, Dr. Barraza? You know, when he talks about those serious people, <laughs> um, left to wonder what I'll say but <laughs> <laughs> but to me I think my source of inspiration has been my dad mm-hmm. yeah uh, just looking at the way he does things and uh, the way he has allowed me early enough to take charge of of, of my life and uh, that has really motivated me to move up to where I am the second person uh, I, I would call I would say uh, the late Dr. Robert Saisi, that uh, unfortunately passed on last year, or not two years ago because of Corona. Mm. But he actually saved my life as uh, when I was five years old because I had a lot of bouts of malaria mm. s- several times. Mm-hmm. There was a time when I went in and one of the nurses, I think, made a mistake. Uh, made, we call it medical mistakes. Huh? Sometimes they happen. I get an injection and then it, things go wrong. But he was just around the corner and he came in and actually he saved my life because I had actually gone into what we call uh, an anaphylactic shop. Mm. So that was really a source of inspiration and I told myself I must become a doctor to save lives. That's why I'm here. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and as we understand saving lives and cervical cancer in Kenya, mm-hmm. what's the current state of cervical cancer in Kenya and why is it a significant health concern? Yeah, the cervical cancer, first it's, it's good to define uh, what the cervix is mm-hmm. so that we know what we are addressing because cervix can also mean neck, Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah the neck literally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in this case we are talking about the, the lowermost part of the uterus 
uh, it is uh, a tiny part of the uterus and this part of it is, is inside the vagina and that's why it's exposed to some of these agents that cause cervical cancer so having really defined what the cervix is we should also know it is invisible so we have to really to examine for you to see where the cervix is so the situation is that uh, we have uh, a number of women being diagnosed with uh, cervical cancer i may first give the the, the global picture is that uh, we have more than half a million uh, cases each each year and we track down to our country the latest statistics that is recorded was around 5,300 but I know it could be more per year and uh, out of which half of that number uh, sort of reported as mortality arising from uh, cancer of the cervix another bit is that uh, most of it is diagnosed late uh, they come to us when they are maybe above stage two and above because by that time they start having uh, the symptoms notably we are seeing cervical cancer in uh, women who are in the less privileged population uh, in that uh, they, they are uh, the lower the low income earners um, they, they come from neighborhoods that are not really affluent and then in addition to that there are women who have got many more children uh, we call this grand multiparity women with many more children so this is the kind of picture that we are seeing of uh, the women who come under our care with cervical cancer and how does cervical cancer typically develop and what are the common warning signs of cervical cancer yeah the the development of cervical cancer uh, we to address this we must look at uh, the risk factors associated with it we now know that there's a direct association cause and effect relationship between human papilloma virus and uh, development of cancer of the cervix i don't want to don't want to go into the details of uh, genetic changes and uh, the pathology or how it happens but for the general population we should know that um infection with human papilloma virus more so if it occurs when a woman is still much younger then we that really puts them on the path towards development of cervical cancer the issue is not usually the infection because we know that uh, the prevalence of hpv in east africa actually is around 30 percent as compared to other parts of the world which is around 11 percent so we have quite a significant prevalence of hpv so even one single sexual exposure can put someone at a risk of getting the infection. The problem is usually persistence. Many women clear the disease. By the time they are 30, then they have cleared the disease. But there are factors that lead to persistence. One of them is could be there are very high risk types that persist longer, or there are <coughs> other core factors in the host this include uh, maybe they're immunosuppressed but in this case the commonest being hiv whereby we know that the persistence is four to five the risk is four to five times more than the women who have got uh, good immunity and the low immunity could not just be due to hiv we also have women on organ transplant uh, cancer treatment and all that and also other core factors include smoking uh, multiple sexual partners of course this we know it increases the, the more variants of uh, infection and uh, um, co-infection with other sexual transmitted infections mm -hmm. because we now know that there, there could be a relationship between co-infection with uh, I mean co-infection with other sexual transmitted infections like chlamydia amongst others of course the other associations that have been described i may not mention them now the use of uh, contraceptives which uh, we may not really delve into because there's postulation that there could be some relationship with that okay yeah. and 
Dr. Chris, in terms of cervical cancer, can you explain the concept of people-centered healthcare systems and how it relates to the prevention, treatment, and combating of cervical cancer? Mm, thanks. Thanks, Halima. <coughs> um, there's a lot of uh, dynamism in as far as uh, the approach, programmatic approach to managing uh, uh, conditions, these conditions, or health-related conditions for that matter. And there's a dynamic a paradigm shift rather from um, a, clish, a clinician perspective. So gone are the days when uh, <coughs> the doctor knew everything and the patient was on the receiving end and they were informed on what they're supposed to do. Now there's a paradigm shift for us to think through how, what if we came from a patient's perspective and be responsive to their needs and then we'll be able to strike a balance between what really the population, the patient requires and what from a technical point of view as doctors can be able to provide our solutions to. So a, a, a patient or a people-centered approach basically talks to a health system where um, as doctors, as healthcare providers, we go to the other end of the coin or the table for that matter and be a bit more responsive to the needs of, uh, of the people. The solutions we provide have to come from, from the people. And it boils on um, several aspects. One is uh, just looking at making information available so that people can be able to really know what are some of the disease conditions that may affect them. Contextualizing some of the disease conditions that we have. For instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, we, as a country, we need to be aware that certain parts of Kenya that more prevalent conditions compared to other parts of Kenya. Dr. I talked about uh, HIV and cervical cancer. So we would be surprised that cervical cancer will be more common in areas that have higher rates of HIV, as an example. So if you come up with an intervention that's blanket, that says we are going to manage cervical cancer across the whole country without considering some of those factors, then you may not be as responsive. There are some parts of the country that have more uh, cardiovascular diseases, as an example. So you want to customize interventions that fit those particular populations, and then engage the population to come up with solutions that are more relevant. You've heard of stories where you come up with an intervention, you bring it to the population and they don't use it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I've heard of situations where people actually build, build hospitals, very huge hospitals with a lot of millions of shillings gone into it, but no one uses it. Why? Because it wasn't responsive to the people or to the needs of the population that they are serving. The other aspect is basically looking at um, how can we be able to have more access uh, to the services that we are providing. And access in this case, usually it's usually physical access. So making this a bit more accessible. And you're looking at looking at uh, looking at uh, having primary healthcare interventions that brings services closer to the people for them to be able to to access them. And the second access point usually that we talk about is uh, financial access, so the cost of of the services, so that we can be able to come up with interventions that can be able to support uh, people a bit more. And then the last aspect that I want to talk about is. Uh, it's just being able to be adaptable uh, to the dynamics, changing dynamics of of the diseases and the way they present themselves or manifest themselves as it were. When I was in medical school a few years ago, we used to read and say cervical cancer affects women above 60 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the practice is different now. So so you may find even, I think, look, the, the youngest patient probably could be... We have had 18 years, we've had 20 yeah. years. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So as young as 18 years, 20 years also getting cervical cancer. So if you are not adaptable, adaptive to this change in the disease presentation, then you may come up with interventions. Thinking that cervical cancer only affects above 60, then you leave out this very critical population without interventions as it were. So by and large, there are the three aspects that I can talk to when I'm talking about people-centered healthcare. Yeah. Okay. And how does AMREF's new strategy address the challenges of cervical cancer in Kenya? 
So our new strategy uh, focuses on um, women mm -hmm. and, and young people. Mm -hmm. And that's our, actually our, our mission. And I'm glad actually the partnership you're having with COGS because COGS also, that's their mandate actually. Mm -hmm. The COGS mandate is basically <laughs> to take care of the interests of women and their health needs. Mm -hmm. So we, we are looking at uh, how can we provide solutions to this population through primary health care interventions. And actually that's our primary goal as it is. And Cervical cancer becomes critical to us, of course, because it affects women, okay? And then at the same time, we, if you look at the disease progression, it starts from an early stage when people are still a bit younger. By the time you are getting cervical cancer, maybe at 40, the process started about 15 years earlier, okay? So the thought process being, we need to at now focus a bit more on young women, okay, and probably adolescent girls, so that you can put in preventive measures to prevent the development of fulminant, what we call fulminant cancer of the cervix, 15 years or 10 years later, as it is. So AMREF strategy is to focus on these population groups by providing them with uh, approaches that can be able to prevent the progression of these diseases mm -hmm. as it is and cervical cancer is a critical component of, of, of our strategy uh, because in our population actually it affects a lot of women and quite a number of women have died of cervical cancer the disease has progressed over time and they haven't known that actually this the disease is progressing over time so if we can put in place some interventions early enough then you can avoid some deaths that may occur later on in, in life and in terms of strategies and partnerships, can you provide an overview of the partnership between COGS and AMREF and specific goals related to maternal and neonatal health? Okay. So I'll mention a few of them and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, the acting CEO to also just mention what you've been able to do. So by and large, uh, as AMREF, we, we envision as a situation where every woman and every young person in this country will be able to have access to equitable health care. So, and you can't do this alone, okay, you can't do this alone. So we, we've purposed this year to really reach out and partner with like-minded uh, entities to be able to work together. And some of the things that we are looking at, broadly speaking, and the question we're asking ourselves is, for instance, why are women still dying of preventable causes in the 21st century? Okay, and one of the preventable causes of death in women is cervical cancer. Unfortunately, yeah, it's usually very painful if a woman comes. Doctor will tell you a woman comes to you with stage four cervical cancer. You know very well at the back of your mind this took 15 years mm. to reach where we are. And unfortunately, they may have gone through the health system and we've missed it out at different stages. By the time they reach the gynecologist here, it's a bit too late in the day. So we're looking at what, what, how can we partner with other organizations for us to put together resources and thoughts that can be able to tackle this at a broader perspective. We've started with COGS because as I, as I mentioned, our mission is more or less very similar with COGS. But our bigger picture is to actually enshrine this at the Ministry of Health level, at the CS level, at the DG's level, and be able to really encourage other partners to join this fight. And a critical thing that you want to look at is actually maternal mortalities, broadly speaking. So just being able to identify what are the commonest causes of maternal mortalities Postpartum hemorrhage is an example. It's a critical thing. Uh, infections, cervical cancer or cancers for that matter, not just necessarily cervical cancer. So that once we have that kind of you know database that gives us what are the what are the commonest causes of, of, of maternal mortalities, then we come up with strategies, the roadmap towards ending maternal mortalities in Kenya, and we are looking at achieving this. Uh, 
SDG 3.1 that talks about reducing maternal mortalities to less than 70 per 100,000 in, in, in this country. Where we are right now, we're above 350. Okay, Different data sources give us different uh, measures. So moving from where we are at 350, I'll take that as the benchmark, to 70, the next seven years. It's a tall order, but we believe with partnerships with the likes of Cox and other like-minded partners, we can actually be able to achieve that and, and change forever and the, the, the picture that we have in you know, as far as maternal mortalities in this country is concerned. I just want to mention, Halima, that for the last seven years, we've only moved seven by a, a figure of seven. <laughs> <laughs> if we continue like that for the next, if we continue at this rate, then it will take us 100 years before we achieve the SDG 3.2, 3.1. And therefore, we must actually proactively be involved in the process so that you can be able to achieve this and probably save a few lives of our mothers. Yeah. But I want to, Dr. Eddie, to just chime in also from that partnership perspective so that you can be able to see how we're working together as a team. Please. Yeah, thank you. We, as a COGS, we are really happy to work with AMREF in this partnership in ending preventable maternal mortality, really preventable deaths. And it's going beyond just the mothers, also looking at uh, the, the children. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I usually look at it in three key areas because this collaboration also involves uh, training. Mm -hmm. um, how do we improve our skills? It, we also have issues with the research. What is killing women? How can we address them? And of course, uh, service delivery also. Mm. Notably is that uh, we can save women from postpartum hemorrhage, but they end up dying from cervical cancer. That's true. And that's where now this partnership comes in to just not only create awareness, but also map up strategies or other really strengthen strategies that can end preventable deaths from cervical cancer. And Cervical Cancer Awareness Month is significant to the context of maternal health. So how does cervical cancer impact mater maternal and neonatal health? And what preventative measures are being, measures are being emphasized in this? My senior can take that. Like yeah, it. maybe I, I'll start with the, with the last bit because mm -hmm. we have to prevent it. The, the, how it impacts maternal health, it, it is so obvious because for once a woman dies from cervical cancer, more or less than not, the family breaks up many times. Our, our, the women are the backbone of the society in that the children will miss a mother, the men will miss their, their wives, will lose their wives, and so it becomes a, a broken kind of family. And that is why we have to prevent cervical cancer. WHO has put in a, a kind of a, a call for elimination of cervical cancer mm. using a, a strategy which is a, the acronym is 907090 mm -hmm. strategy which we have adopted as a country and I'm sure AMREF is very strong mm -hmm. in this particular 907090 strategy which I may speak on for a very long time but let me just summarize it. Mm -hmm. It just means that 90% of women at least should have uh, primary prevention with uh, vaccination by 15 years. I know this is uh, a subject that is a little bit controversial. Mm -hmm. And then the 70 is that uh, we should have a high performance test to screen these women. You know, we started this journey more than a decade ago where we were screening women using a single visit approach you use acetic acid to see whether there are any changes on the cervix but now we know that we have a high performance test which in this case is hpv dna mm -hmm. screening just to to be to to check does the woman have the high risk type that causes cervical cancer but we don't stop at screening it's unethical to have a screening program with no intervention so out of the women who are screen positive or who have premalignant condition, premalignant means the disease takes a long time before it develops into obvious cancer. Even those who have diagnosed with cancer, 90% of them should receive 
care and an intervention. And the interventions are many. It, it, it ranges from uh, um, just um, excision procedures, which means you remove the part that is affected by the disease, or to radical procedures, including radiation and palliative care, depending on the stage that you get them at. And um, how does community involvement and education play a role in these strategies? Yeah. Um, maybe I, I may go first, and then yeah. Dr. Baraza will will pick it up. Yeah, prevention of cervical cancer. It is multi pronged. We already know the risk factors, and some of these can be addressed by public health education or even forums. For example, we know that uh, early sexual debut will. Uh, predispose them to cervical cancer. So is, is it possible to keep our our children longer in school? Um, like I said, it, it, it's, there's no really magic bullet that is only the, the, the doctors who can do this. This is multi-sectoral from our religious leaders, Ministry of Education, gender matters, mm -hmm. to ensure we keep our girls longer in school. Uh, then there are also issues to do with uh, avoiding uh, the other core factors. We have got abstinence, uh, be faithful campaigns, amongst others. Um, maybe just to mention a bit about vaccination, because the countries that have eliminated cervical cancer, I'll give an example like Australia. Um, they have uh, very robust vaccination programs which vaccinate not only girls, but also boys. We also have countries like North America in Canada, which are on their way towards elimination. We they have also very robust uh, vaccination programs. Yes, just and thanks, Doc, for that. Um, I'll, I'll approach it from, um, just to add on to what Dr. Tari has mentioned. If, if you look at uh, a screening program, for instance, the, and compare the cost of a treatment program for cervical cancer, the difference is significant. Because mm. it may just cost maybe around an average of 2,000, 3,000 to do a screening, say a pap smear or via AV live or whatever method you are going to use. Look at the cost holistically. Vis-a-vis -vis treatment of mm. cervical cancer, which may go into hundreds of thousands. Okay, and what I usually say is that 15 years down the line, okay, the cost of treating cervical cancer definitely will go much higher. So if you do a screen today, you save dollars of shillings, mm -hmm. or rather dollars or shillings, better shillings in future. So the, And that's why we emphasize on screening, because we are actually managing a scenario that could be more expensive. And there's a concept that we call catastrophic health expenditure. What that means is basically that we are as poor as just one disease condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to eat a family. So you just need one person in the family to go down cervical cancer, and it may wipe out all the resources that that family has ever had, <clears throat> as it were, because of the costs. And the cost not just in the treatment, but if you are a lady and you are in the productive age groups and you are going to work and now you start developing cervical cancer, it means you can't go to work because there's a smell that you start producing. Mm -hmm. So you don't be comfortable going to work. So chances are you lose your job. When you start getting your treatment, it means you will spend a lot of time in hospital, so you will not go to work. So the productivity at work becomes a problem. So if we are the person that the family has been depending on, then it means the revenue that family is completely cut out. So the future of that family definitely becomes bleak for that matter. The second cost is psychological cost uh, to it because we are still stigmatized. If the mention of cancer in the society, everyone starts saying, oh, that one has cancer, one has cancer. So the mental health aspects of it become very costly to that family, to that woman, to that husband, to that the children for that matter. It's a cost that most of us don't think about, but just diagnosis of cancer is on its own, psychological, psychologically very expensive for that matter. 
So we usually we want to talk about aspects of how can we prevent this so that we we don't develop cancer as it were. I know the government has come up with quite a number of measures and uh, as I'm ref we've been really supporting some of these initiatives to be able to really see how can we have universal health coverage and how can some of the insurance schemes like NHIF be able to cover most of this, including screening for cervical cancer and even treatment for cervical cancer. The second thing is how can we have equipment that the government can provide to even far-reaching places. And Halima will tell you that uh, if you need to have radi radiotherapy for cervical cancer, it's one of the treatment modalities. If you come from Bungoma, where I come from, you have to come all the way to Nairobi mm -hmm. for you to be treated for radiotherapy. And even Nairobi, I think you only have like how many machines now, look? Are they four or five? Yeah, r right now, actually, there, there has been an expansion towards yeah. availability of radiation. Yeah. Um, in the Western region, Yes, we now have more teaching and referral. Now it has. Uh, now it has uh, good. Yeah. radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been there not for not for very not long. For very long. Okay. Yeah, at the coast also in Nairobi we have several mm -hmm. um, facilities that are offering radiation. Mm -hmm. But like you say, the cost of treating is quite exorbitant mm -hmm. because uh, we are looking at not just the, the psychological bit, but the financial bit. Treating cervical cancer through radiation, you require at least two months yeah. to, to go through the whole process because you are looking at 25 fractions of external beam radiation. radiation and then yeah. After that, you have to do what we call brachytherapy or intracavitary mm -hmm. treatment. Yeah. So, so it's a long time, so, but I, that's why I think we should really emphasize on, mm. on preventing cancer. And with AMREF's focus on empowering women and young people, are there specific initiatives underway to educate and involve young people in cervical cancer prevention? Certainly, yes. There are quite some programs that um, as AMREF we've involved ourselves in and uh, aimed at basically uh, supporting young people the projects that we run um, across the country, actually in most counties, in relation to to just sensitizing young young people, both in school and out of school, because again, as long as a lady is sexually active, then they are likely to get cervical cancer. So in our reproductive health uh, messaging, uh, we've been able to have specific projects that run that. Critically, again, is uh, just just engaging in the education sector as thought leader, thought leaders in that, and the school health programs. We've actually involved ourselves in that because uh, policies surrounding, you know, HPV vaccination. The doc, doc mentioned that there's a bit of hesitancy, mm. and it's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, it's a big problem. So we've involved ourselves in some projects that aimed at actually sensitizing parents and guardians mm. on. HPV um, uh, vaccinations and there's a time actually we uh, personally I was involved in a, a such intervention in Trokana, the farthest part of this country where we were actually sensitizing we go out of the way, go to the schools we go to hospitals we go even to households to be able to sensitize once you've done mapping and you know there's a, a lady here who could be the right age for vaccination, then we actually go out of our way to be able to do that. Mm. So there are quite a number of community interventions that we do, school-based projects that we do, including even universities, so that we can be able to just sensitize them on, 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 on how to handle productive health aspects, including menstrual hygiene, including um, STIs and other infections that may predispose them to developing cervical cancer, and just being able to be nurtured into responsible adults yeah and are there specific programs or initiatives that are focused primarily on supporting women in last mile communities that amref is involved in yes yeah, certainly also mm. we've done that quite quite a lot last mm. mile meaning that we want to deliver services closer to, to the people we've had projects in samburu we've had projects in trokana we've had projects in homa bay uh, partnering with several 
initiatives. We've had projects that deal with, um, for instance, fistula uh, management and, and care, uh, projects that deal with uh, FGM, okay, uh, care and management, Kisi, Nyamira, Kajado here. Um, and when the cost quite quality now we have a project there mm -hmm. and uh, we, we have projects that are specifically looking at uh, primary health care interventions just supporting the national government to be able to to bring services closer to the people through development of primary care networks because a primary care network basically is aimed at providing that solution providing services closer to the people um, engaging the communities sensitizing them uh, putting up uh, multidisciplinary teams and just ensuring that actually the services that are layered so that we have a uh, community interventions level level two level three level four and have a very clear referral mechanisms and even outreaches AMREF has supported so many outreaches in this country in as far as just ensuring that places like Trukana where the closest some of the distances from households to the facilities about 30 kilometers so you want to have an interface so that you can bring the services close to the people through outreaches. And there's a model we call Kimoromo that I don't want to go into today in detail. But just looks at how can you be able to bring services closer to the people, including animal health, human health, uh, plant health, close to the people so that they can be able to access the services much faster. And then when we're looking at primary care networks, one of the things that's really important is looking at incorporating data in digital transformation processes. So how does AMRF's strategic plan leverage digital transformation to improve cervical cancer awareness, especially in last mile communities? So one of the things that we've done deliberately and uh, as AMREF, is to support the Ministry of Health to develop what we call an observatory. An observatory has three components. One, it's, it gives us data on the most prevalent conditions across the different primary care networks in the country. As I mentioned earlier, I would at a click at a bat of a button know that cervical cancer is more prevalent in this part of the country esophageal cancer is more prevalent in this part of the country or this particular disease condition is more prevalent in this part of the country so data driven okay the second aspect of that is for us to be able to know how is the functionality of the systems that we are putting up the pcns that we are putting up so we are doing we are going further to just be, be able to really identify for you to say that a primary care network is functional what are the parameters that you need to put in place? How do you measure? How do you assess the functionality of, of a PCN? The third one that's also very data-driven in the observatory is what are the potential outcomes and what's the potential impact of setting this up? So there are quite a number of disease conditions, including cervical cancer, as it were, that you are able to really be, make a projection and say, if things remain the way they are, this PCN is likely to give us this number of patients developing cervical cancer. And that's how programs develop. We say, can we now look for money and prevent this? Because if we don't do anything about it, this is where we shall be. But if we do something about it right now, we'll be able to make an intervention that will stop the progression of this. And as I said earlier, cervical cancer, cancer of the service, a perfect disease, okay? In, in epidemiology, you talk about it's a perfect example of a disease that can, can have a very, very good prevention program because it takes time for it to develop. As opposed to others like, let's say, malaria, okay, whose incubation period is a bit shorter for that matter. Cervical cancer is a perfect because it takes a lot of time for it to develop into fulminant cancer, uh, cancer of the cervix. So you can actually plan and come up with interventions using data that can be able to manage this 20 years down the line and you'll be as close to hitting your target or impact as close with a lot of precision precision compared to other disease conditions that we have yeah. 
That's fair. And Dr. Eli, I have a question. So how does health, how do healthcare policies in Kenya impact the fight against cancer? Yeah, we have a very healthy policy environment. By this I mean we have a very good uh, policy direction, uh, especially guided by the National Cancer Control Program. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, if you just look through that website, they are very beautiful policy documents. In addition, we have guidelines, mm -hmm. which have uh, been developed by support with partners like uh, AMREF and also COGS mm -hmm. and other partners giving that technical input. Uh, it's not enough to have the policy documents. Now we now have to reach a place whereby we lobby for resources to follow the implementation of the policies. This is, uh, has been well explained by Dr. Baraza here about uh, what they are doing even to the last mile. That needs uh, resources to, to do that. Um, having said that, uh, it's good just to also mention, probably at the risk of, of going back, about the, the, the vaccine hesitancy. Um, the government of Kenya rolled out a uh, vaccination program as part of the prevention strategy for cervical cancer, especially uh, to, for young girls. But uh, there has been a lot of uh, resistance to vaccine uptake. The concerns have been addressed, uh, though the consensus has not been reached, and uh, probably the concerns has been to, to do with the fertility issues that uh, what is in the vaccine may predispose to formation of antibodies against pregnancies. Mm. There has been concerns about uh, the content of aluminium. Uh, others include autism, but uh, we know that the trials have shown that the vaccines are safe. It just needs more engagement with the, those who are uh, having concerns about the vaccine to see that we can have uh, address address the issue of uptake of the HPV vaccine. Okay. And Dr. Chris, you talked about SDG 3.1, but how does AMREF's new strategy align with global health policies like the st sustainable development goals in the fight against uh, cervical cancer in Kenya? Yeah, so I just mentioned that because <coughs> that's where we we are focusing a lot more. Mm -hmm. But by and large, AMREF is in support of quite a number of SDGs along the health-related SDG, SDG 3. So 3.1 talks about maternal mortalities, 3.2 talks about neonatal mortalities, neonatal deaths. So for this partnership we're having with COGS actually, we are focusing a lot more on the 3.1 and 3.2. But others, like malaria, <coughs> um, Survival cancer control, actually. Um, um, climate change, we're still aligning ourselves to the climate change interventions, as an example, which are still part of the water and sanitation, just still part of this uh, SDGs that you're looking at by 2030. Mm -hmm. And also just aligning ourselves with the country's uh, Vision 2030 uh, priorities that, that we have. So, AMREF still has positioned itself as a thought leader in most of this. And we're actually sitting on most of the national and international bodies that are discussing this. I think uh, just last month, that was in December or around that time, we saw us actively actually participating in the Global Climate Change Convention. Just to mention but a few of some of the things that, that we are doing. Because we believe that if we don't participate in in providing solutions to the health in Africa, then uh, our, our understanding or our role in, 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 in this paradigm shift would not be achieved. So we really need to, we must work with international organizations, local organizations for us to be able to really define the future of healthcare in Africa as AMREF. Yeah. What are AMREF Health Africa's future goals in the fight against cervical cancer? But if we come specifically to cervical cancer, mm -hmm. um, we align with what uh, Dr. Ellie 
talked about mm-hmm. the 907090 mm-hmm. uh, vision or mission by 2030 mm-hmm. so amref's vision is to support that alignment so that you can have proper vaccine uptake proper screening and proper treatment services or access to treatment services so what close with cogs the national cancer control uh, board and other like-minded partners for us to be able to achieve this objective. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do any of you have any final thoughts or comments on Subco Cancer Awareness and Subco Cancer Awareness Month? Dr. Eli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we must put ourselves in the shoes of the women who are really the bearers, the, the, they bear the brunt of this disease and look at the effect that this, this condition has on their families. And that will cause us to think seriously about preventing it. It will not be done by one organization or one person. This is a kind of a multifaceted uh, engagement, right from the lead under the leadership of the Ministry of Health, the National Cancer Control Program, and we plug into that national strategy for cancer prevention. Dr. Chris? I think Doc has summed it up okay. very well. Okay. Just support what he says that we cannot do it as an individual organization. It calls for a multi partner engagement and having these discussions, not just wait for the for January when you have cervical cancer awareness, but really have a robust plan that runs through the, the whole year so that every day becomes an awareness and then this day and probably be able to also just track the milestones that we've been able to achieve. Sometimes I feel like we we don't do very well in terms of data. So we don't really track what we have been able to, to achieve over time. Mm-hmm. So it would just be a clarion call that we partner better, track the milestones and be able to achieve the ninety, seventy, ninety targets that we all have. Okay. And thank you so much, Dr. Chris, and thank you so much, Dr. Eli, for your invaluable insight and shedding light on the critical role of people-centered health systems in our fight against cervical cancer. It is clear through community involvement, education, accessible health care, we can make significant strides in cervical cancer awareness and prevention. This approach will not only save lives, but it will also empower communities with the knowledge and tools that they need to take charge of their health. To our listeners, thank you so much um, for joining us on this important discussion on cervical cancer. It's been your host, Halima. And if you have any questions, queries, or concerns, please join the conversation and contact us on our social media platforms, which are Twitter at Amref underscore Kenya, Facebook at Amref KE, and Instagram, which is hashtag Amref Kenya. And thank you so much for listening. We appreciate your feedback and engagement. Stay informed, stay healthy, and see you next time. Bye.